Good morning. It's good to be back. I've never been in quarantine before, uh, but uh, I want I really appreciate Craig from Presbytery uh, speaking last week, and um, but uh, they were just concerned that I had been exposed to somebody uh, who was infected with COVID-19 when I got my flu shot because I had a cold and, you know, those are some of the same symptoms. Uh, so I had to wait for my uh, tests to get back, which were negative, but I appreciate everybody's kind thoughts and contacting me and uh, felt good to be missed. The, um, I do have some announcements. Uh, first of all, I wanna congratulate some individuals. It's their anniversary. John and Kathy Bittner, 51st wedding anniversary, November 8th. Yay! John and Donna Duvall on their 63rd wedding anniversary on November 9th. And uh, that, those are wonderful. If you have an anniversary and you'd like us to include it, please let us know. We'll put it on our calendar and include it. I hate missing anybody's special occasions. Um, the next thing, uh, we have these wonderful prayer request cards, and uh, they even have a graphic of a dove on them. And uh, thank you for creating these. They're by the offering plates so that you have something to write prayer requests on so that we can include them on our prayer lists. And uh, you can just fill one out and drop it in the offering plate whenever you are able to. Um, another announcement would be uh, you should have received our November newsletter. And uh, that uh, already has a story about Thanksgiving and my dog stealing a turkey. But... Uh, but you can read that. Our plan is to get the December newsletter out early, uh, right before Thanksgiving, and there should be in that newsletter uh, a list of all of the sermons uh, that should take us through Advent and into Christmas, uh, and times for all of our services, and the theme for this coming Advent season. Um, and that should take us up to the new year. Uh, it's amazing uh, that in some ways it seems like this time period has taken a very long time and in other ways it's just flown by. So it's definitely a unique period of time. And the last announcement uh, we are going, even though some college students are home, some are in college, we always like to send them something uh, to help them during their finals week while they're studying. And we wanna make sure we know of all of those college students. So please either put, put their name uh, and address in the offering plate, maybe what college they're attending, uh, so we can write a little note, um, and we will send them something. Also, uh, we'd also like to send individuals who are in the armed services something, uh, if not for Thanksgiving, for the Christmas season. And, uh, and that might take some time if they're overseas. So let us know if you have a grandchild or a, a child, um, or a close relative who is in the armed services, we'd like to reach out to them, let them know that their home church is thinking about them, and, uh, and we'd definitely like to send them something for Christmas. And uh, I think that's wonderful. Deacons are reaching out to these, uh, these individuals. Okay, please join me now for our call to worship. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Face each God, fit each day God brings us new opportunities to learn and grow. God is near to all of us. We will not fear to call upon the Lord. 
Come, let us praise God who walks with us daily. Let us open our hearts and spirits to God who loves and lives with us. Our hymn is printed in the bulletin. There's a wilderness in God's mercy. Wideness. There, wideness. There you go. Join with me in our prayer of confession. Faithful God, we come before you with many issues on our hearts. We get frustrated and angry at the way things are going in the world. We want your immediate intervention. And when we don't see things happening the way we think they should be, we are quick to dismiss you and any thought of your presence. Help us to stop our selfishness and our quick anger. Remind us that you will work with us and through us for peace and hope. Release us from the traps of quick tests of your faithfulness and help to see the big picture of your awesome love that spans all of time. Forgive us for our pettiness and our stubbornness. Bring us back to you, O Lord. Help us to live lives of joyful service, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us silently confess our sins. We seek the Lord's strength and presence, knowing that those who seek will find. We believe that Jesus came to save sinners. We rejoice in the truth that we are forgiven and made new, free to live a new life in Christ. Thanks be to God. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated and join me in our responsive reading. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Rise up, O Lord. Do not let mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are only human. Uh, okay, so our scripture readings, uh, this sermon was actually meant for last week uh, when I was not able to be with you. And remember, last week was uh, a couple things. We were continuing uh, our sermon about Reformation Sunday. So two weeks ago, we had John Calvin and Luther in Europe. Uh, and then Germany and Geneva. And this Sunday, uh, 
we're going to talk about uh, John Knox, um, but because it's Scotland, we usually talk about St. Andrew and Presbyterian concepts of all of us being saints, and that might be stretching it for me, but uh, the concept of that as Christians. And uh, so uh, we usually talk about those two individuals uh, that have the connection with Scottish Presbyterian heritage. And uh, so our first verse uh, has to do with uh, Andrew, and our second verse has to do with John Calvin, or uh, John Knox. Um, okay, John 135 to 51. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Then the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated means Peter. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Beth Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets have also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree, you will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Our second verse comes from Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let every one be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes for the authorities are God's servants. So give their full time of governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be 
to God. So one of the questions that Presbyterians often ask is about our connection to Scotland and why on Reformation Sunday we often talk about our history and John Knox, and they also ask why we talk about St. Andrew when saints or the concept of sainthood is often something found in the Catholic Church, not so much in the Presbyterian Church. And we're going to talk about both of those things today. So the answer to both those questions is tied to our Presbyterian history and to the Scottish Reformation. So first, we had the Reformation that was really taking hold in Europe, but it quickly spread to Scotland, England, and Wales as well. So we talked about Calvin and Luther in a previous sermon, and the Protestant Reformation, as we know, began in Europe. The authority of the Catholic Church had been unquestioned until the Renaissance in the 15th century. So 1,400 years. This questioning coincided with a number of things. The church had become extremely political in nature at that time. It placed an emphasis on its own financial welfare above that of the poor. And remember that this was a result of human mistakes, not the broader church or the body of Christ. So when I say that, when people have complaints or problems or negative experiences with any church, and they talk to me about this, they usually have a story, and uh, I usually relate to them that, yes, the church is the body of Christ, but it's made up of sinners. It's made up of imperfect human beings that make mistakes. We're here for God's grace and forgiveness. So we're not perfect. So this was the first time in history that these things had happened. Around 1450, we know that the printing press was invented, and not only did they print Luther's new translation of the Bible because he believed that everybody should be able to read God's word, they also began printing treatises about complaints surrounding what was happening in the church. So, for instance, they would print his 95 theses, and uh, I think he should have just rounded it up to 100, but that's okay. So Luther began the German Reformation, and however, uh, because of the printing press, this spread rapidly. Everybody was reading about this. And so the interesting thing about this second scripture passage that we read today is that for hundreds and hundreds of years, beginning in Israel, uh, the kings and the prophets in Israel were anointed uh, to be servants of God, to lead the people. And so that's where this concept came, that uh, leaders, kings, queens, were anointed by God. And this verse was preached over and over again to remind individuals of that connection between uh, whatever kingdom they were in and the rulers and the subjects. But here we have some brand new things happening. Luther reinterpreted this scripture. He was the first one to give it a new interpretation. And we can even go back into the Old Testament and we can see uh, 
leaders, kings, that yes, were originally anointed to be God's servants. However, they turned away from God's rules and became unfair to God's people. And so Luther said, well, what would God want us to do if kings and queens uh, were turning away from God's word? And that's where the Reformation began with this very scripture passage and Luther's reinterpretation of it. So in the 1530s, we know John Calvin uh, moved to Paris, France. He studied law and religion. He was converted to the early Reformed movement and was eventually forced to leave Paris. He ended up in Geneva. And in 1536, he published the Institute of Christian Religion. This was later expanded when he resided in Geneva, and it became one of the most important documents of the Reformation. So it was from Calvin that John Knox gained the knowledge of the Reformation. And this forms our theology of church policy or polity and our church government. Our church government or Presbyterian church government was the most unique government in the world. And it's the government that our nation was also modeled after. This forms our theology, our polity, our government, and United States democratic government and representative form of government is based upon this. Now I'm sorry to uh, it took a little while to get to John Knox, uh, but this is a story which became our church story, and it takes us from Western Europe, Germany, France, to Scotland. So John Knox studied with John Calvin in Geneva, and he brought uh, this Reformed theology back to the church in Scotland with him. And though Luther and Calvin are primarily credited with the theology that brought about the broader Protestant Reformation, like the Lutheran Church, John Knox is usually credited with founding Presbyterianism. So just look at the roots of some of these words. Protestant, protestant, one who protests. Reformation, to reform, specifically not to reform to what humans want, but to get back to the original meaning of God's word in the church. So reform wasn't changing to some modern standard in their minds. Reform was getting back to the original concepts in the New Testament and what Jesus taught us. One of the things was working with the poor. The word Presbyterian from the word presbyter, which is the individual, or presbytery, which would be an organized body or a representative group uh, democratically meeting for the good of the whole church. God's desire believed to be found through the voice of the majority. And so the joke is usually that uh, Presbyterians don't only vote on election day, they vote every day. If you've ever been to a presbytery meeting, there must be a hundred votes in that meeting. So one of the interesting things, and I follow this theology and form of government in my own ministry, I never preach on a controversial issue because I believe that if I preach Christ's word, 
the individuals, the, the presbyters, the members of the congregation, will hear Christ's word and interpret that as God speaks to them for themselves. And then, if we have to make any decision as a church, God will speak through the whole church when we make a decision as one body in Christ. So I never preach on any controversial issue. I pray for peace, understanding, for the application of Jesus Christ in our lives. But following this concept that God doesn't just speak through me, God speaks through each and every one of you, and that's how we come together to enact what God would have us do. So Knox was educated in Glasgow at St. Andrews, which was named after St. Andrews, which we heard about in our very first passage. And he was taken as prisoner when France attacked St. Andrews, the college, but he made his way from France to England. He served briefly as a chaplain to Edward VI. However, shortly after Queen Mary Tudor came to the throne in 1553, he fled to Geneva, where he met John Calvin. In 1559, he returned to Scotland, became a minister at Edinburgh, uh, as well as the leader of the Reforming Party, and he published three documents. He wrote part of the Scots Confession in 1560, and we can see his influence on that confession. He was a primary contributor to the Book of Common Order, and we've had many revisions to that, but we still use the Book of Common Order. And he wrote the history of the Reformation of Religion within the realms of Scotland. And that's been reprinted many times. In the first Book of Discipline, Knox and the other reformers' goal was to create a godly commonwealth in Scotland, a return to a God led by the people as in ancient Israel and through Jesus Christ. He emphasized charity to the poor and a Presbyterian tradition, education for all, so that everybody could think for themselves, so that everybody could read God's word and make their own decisions as the word or the spirit spoke to them. And so we see a long tradition of churches and presbyteries sponsoring universities. In fact, uh, many of the colleges that I've worked at were originally women's colleges. Wilson College in Chambersburg, Chatham College in Pittsburgh, and they were both started by the local Presbyterian church in the late 1800s. So not only did they support regular universities, but they were one of the first uh, groups to support women's colleges. So, in his tract, Appellations to the Nobility and Com Commonality of Scotland, he speaks in response to our scripture passage. He extended to ordinary people the right, indeed the duty, to rebel against injustice. For, as he told Queen Mary of Scotland later, the sword of justice is God's, and its princes and rulers fail to use it, others may. So what of St. Andrews? How does this all connect with our first scripture passage, St. Andrew? Well, he was the first to be called by Jesus. 200 years before John Knox in 1320, when Scotland's independence was declared with the signing of the declaration at Abroth, Andrew, became the patron saint of Scotland. The flag of Scotland has St. Andrew's cross on it, which honors him. The town of St. Andrew's is named after him. St. Andrew's monastery is built there, and of course it became St. Andrew's University. 
St. Andrew would not be crucified on the same cross that Jesus was crucified upon. So he was crucified as a Christian martyr on a cross in the shape of an ax or a saltire. And, uh, and that is the symbol of St. Andrew on that cross. Now, legend has it that heavily outnumbered battle against the English from Northumberland, Bengus II prayed to St. Andrew. On the day of battle, the clouds formed a cross or an X in the sky, and the Scots were victorious. More importantly to modern Scots, they stressed charity to those in need, a warm welcome and a sharing of the love of Christ. And it's not only the Scottish heritage that we remember, but these attributes of Christians, Christ, and Presbyterians. And as we begin to think about this, one of the concepts that Luther, Calvin, and John Knox, and this is why it's often preached on All Saints Day, which I miss, uh, is that uh, God doesn't only choose certain people uh, to uh, be Christians or to be saints. God allows all of us to accept the Holy Spirit and to allow that Holy Spirit to work through us, to do God's will, and all is possible through Christ. And when we gather together in heaven in new life, we will all be considered Christian saints. Saints meaning those who accepted Christ's forgiveness and grace and allowed the Holy Spirit to work through us. So each and every one of us is given a Christian gift and a Christian duty to do good for others, just as the history of saints. One of the interesting things is uh, the tradition of that word saint, uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, near the end of Advent because Santa is, of course, in relationship to Saint Nicholas. And there's a whole history surrounding that. And one other sermon that will be connected to this will be on St. Andrew's Day, but that's going to be in the spring. So I think two key points uh, of this history still speak to us today, that God speaks to each and every one of us, that we are allowed to discern God's word in our lives, and that we communicate God's word to us through our own church government and throughout our lives. And as we follow Christ's word and the word and the Holy Scriptures, we follow the paths of the technical meaning of saints, which is Christians who have accepted the grace of God. Amen. I'll call your attention to uh, all of those in our ongoing prayer list uh, that is printed in the bulletin. We have new cards uh, by the offering plates that you can add notes. Uh, yes, on one side it has a name and a prayer request, but if you know how any individuals are doing, uh, please let us know. Um, I can update you on a few individuals. I heard that Helen Wright was not doing well, that, that she was in hospice, but I talked to her uh, children, and they informed me that uh, sometimes she bounces back and is doing really well, and sometimes she has some bad days, but 
she's able to communicate on those good days and, uh, and they have been visiting her and, uh, and we had a wonderful conversation. Uh, and of course they ask for our prayers as well. And uh, the, uh, I know that, uh, that Sandy doesn't like me announcing her name or any of her problems, but just prayers that uh, her feet heal and that, uh, you know, she is, uh, this burden is lifted from her uh, so that uh, she no longer needs to contend with that struggle. And uh, are there any other prayer requests that, that we can add to our list? Yes. Your brother-in-law, yes. Okay, good, good. And that surgery went okay? Did that surgery go okay? Good, good. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we just thank you for all of your blessings, especially the blessing of the presence of the Holy Spirit, even amidst our struggles, even amidst the turmoil. We pray that your goodness will shine through. We have faith that uh, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that you are with us, and with this nation and this world. Lord, we pray for peace and understanding, for humility and communication, for love and kindness in this nation and this world. Work through us so that we might do your will, so that we might help others in your name. Lord God, we pray for all of those individuals who are experiencing hardship or illness, who have undergone treatments or operations, who are struggling with illness or other infirmities. Lord, give us your healing power. Give us your peace and comfort. Be with those who are struggling with addiction or emotional issues depression, anxiety, or other issues. And be with those who are seeking, seeking your Holy Spirit. And we pray the way you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us sing our clothing, closing hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
And now as you leave this sanctuary, know that you are forgiven. Accept God's grace. Live a new life as saints through Jesus Christ. And now may the Lord God bless you. May God give you peace and grace and love this day and every day forth. Amen. Thank you.